brighter morning star I am the breath of all creation who always was and is to come I am the one who walked on water short of the glory of God and because there cannot be anything unclean entering into the kingdom of God we are separated but then the grace of God is our everlasting hope that unlocks the gates of heaven through his son Jesus we are accepted. By grace, we grow from flawed and limited beings into beings of truth and light. Grace empowers us to be overcomers, to reign in life and to fulfill divine destiny. This is God's amazing grace. Greetings and thank you for tuning in to Living Strong today. As always, it's our joy and delight to be able to come your way and bring God's Word to you. We're doing a very interesting study on God's amazing grace. And uh, we will continue our study today as we talk about and focus in on God of all grace. 
The main thing that we want to emphasize on our, uh, on, to each of us today on the episode is to help us understand that there is all the grace we need and even more uh, available to us from God. Uh, First Peter chapter 5 and verse 10, Peter calls God, he refers to God as the God of all grace, meaning there is all the grace that we ever need uh, available to us in God. All of that is being, all the grace we ever need in our lives to, uh, to see change, to see God restore, to see God heal, everything we need. There is grace unlimited uh, available to each of us in God. For example, when we look at the life of the Apostle Paul, uh, Paul himself began as a persecutor of the church. Paul started actually by uh, being an opposer to the Christian faith. He persecuted those who believed in Jesus. He went around and he got them arrested. He, uh, in fact, he was there presiding over the stoning of Stephen, one of the early disciples. Uh, he saw him stoned to death, and uh, he proceeded uh, to, uh, to go and capture many more people who believed in Jesus Christ, uh, apprehend them, put them in prison. That was what Paul was, his early life. Now, he was a very highly educated man uh, as, as far as religious things were concerned. Uh, he was a Pharisee. Uh, he was very proud of uh, his learning, his education, his, his background. And so he was very, very opposed uh, to... Jesus Christ and to those who believed in him. Now, when the Lord touched his life and when the Lord um, uh, uh, encountered Saul on his way to Damascus and Saul's life was totally transformed and, and Saul gave his life to the, uh, to the work of the gospel and, and, and preaching Christ, uh, at a much later point, towards, even towards, towards the end of his ministry, when he wrote his epistle to Timothy, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 16, this is what Paul writes. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in, in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Jesus Christ. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who were going to believe on him for everlasting life. So Paul looks back at his beginnings. He says, you know, I was a very bad man. I was a persecutor. I was very hard. I was a blasphemer. I spoke evil things about Jesus. And he says, I was such a man. But I obtained mercy. Meaning God extended his mercy on my life. And he says, the grace of the Lord was exceedingly abundant. Meaning there was this unlimited grace of God that was poured out on me, on my life, that Paul says. And he says, he, he calls himself in verse 15, he says, you know, Jesus Christ came into the world, saved sinners, and Paul says, I am the chiefest of them. The meaning, I am the worst of any sinner uh, that, could, that could have ever been on this earth. I am the worst of sinners, Paul says. And to me, to a man like me, there was abundant grace. There was exceedingly abundant grace that Jesus gave, meaning there was no limit to this grace that he poured out on my life to me who am the chiefest of sinners. And what Paul says there in verse 16 is, Jesus demonstrated his patience, uh, his kindness, his goodness, his mercy to me as a pattern to those who are going to believe, just to show others, to give others an example of how great his grace is. Now, uh, if he could change my life, he can change anybody else's life, is what Paul is saying in a sense. So, what I want to impress on our hearts here today is this, that in Christ, in the Lord, there is exceedingly abundant grace. There is all the grace we ever need uh, to see our lives changed and transformed. A more recent, or I would say a more uh, uh, contemporary example would be that of the man John Newton. 
that many of us are familiar with. The hymn that he wrote, Amazing Grace, is a hymn that is sung probably 10 million times every year, it is estimated. That single hymn is a hymn that has been uh, sung in all kinds of places by all kinds of people through the ages. So back in 1700s, John Newton, an Englishman, he left the Navy and then he became a slave trader uh, across the Atlantic. So here he was, a man uh, who was uh, taking people across the Atlantic and selling them off as slaves. And uh, his own story is one of uh, uh, extreme sin. He was the vilest of people. Uh, his language, the way he spoke on, on the ship and the, and the things he did and the way he worked, uh, it, it was the vilest of vile that we could ever imagine. And then on one of his journeys, as he was doing his slave trading, uh, at, at one of his journeys, there was a huge storm in the sea. And here was John Newton, a man who had turned away from everything that he had known about Jesus Christ, who had, uh, who had refused to even believe. And he was terrible as a person, hard as a man. Here in the middle of the storm, he did one thing that he, that, that he only hoped for that would save his life. He prayed a simple prayer. The ship was about to sink, was full. Uh, and there, he, in that moment when he knew he was, you know, the end was near, he prayed the simple prayer. He said, Lord, have mercy on me. That was all he prayed in that ship that was, that was about to sink in the middle of the Atlantic. Lord, have mercy on me. And the, and the rest of, of it is history. Fourteen days they sailed, they reached harbor. His life was saved. And he began to ponder on what had happened to him. That even though he was so vile, so wicked, that God would have mercy on his life when he cried out to God. Shortly after that, he, uh, he left slave trading. He went on uh, to study theology. He gave his life to the service of the Lord. And for one particular year's New Year's service, he and another friend uh, wrote this hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see, and the hymn goes on. John Newton captured in those words, in, in that hymn, uh, the, the, what the grace of God meant to him and what the grace of God did for him. That he being such a wicked man and a, a man who was involved in slave trade, a man who turned his back against God, that when he cried out for the mercy of God, that God would save even him and, and, and give meaning and purpose for his life. And so here we have another example of God's exceedingly abundant grace, meaning this grace that God gives upon people, that God extends to each of us, is so unlimited if we will only reach out to Him. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 9, Paul describes what God does for us out of mercy and as a demonstration of His grace. Paul says, but God, who was rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So Paul describes our life, that we were dead in sin, that we were totally wicked, that we walked according to the course of this world, uh, that we were driven by our own uh, flesh and our, uh, the fleshly desires of our mind, and that's the way we lived. But there is God, who was so rich in mercy, that means the mercy, the goodness of God is so rich, so unlimited that He reaches out to us no matter how wicked we are. And God extends His grace towards us even though we are so dead in our sins. And what does He do? He brings us out of where we are. He, raises, he has raised us up together and He has made us sit together with Him. Can you imagine? That we who are so wicked, so far away from God, God would say, I'm bringing you right by my side. 
I'm making you sit right next to me. And then Paul says, he's done this to demonstrate, to show the exceeding riches of his grace. Meaning, this is how big the grace of God is. That he would reach down to where we are, as wicked as we are, and he would say, I am giving you my grace, and I'm bringing you right into my presence, and I'm making you sit right by my side. Uh, He has made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus to demonstrate, to show the exceeding riches of His grace. God's mercy and God's grace, they flow together. They're unlimited and they're available for all of us. The story of the prodigal son is basically the story of each one of us. Each one of us have wandered away from God. But when there is repentance and there is a returning to God, we then become recipients of this unlimited mercy and grace of God. The prodigal son, when he walked back to his father, he said, you know, I'll tell my dad, I'll just, I'm fit to be one of your hired servants. He had no idea what was waiting for him. As, as the father saw him, the father ran towards him, embraced him, welcomed him in. And when the prodigal son, you know, made his statement saying, you know, just make me like one of your hired servants. The father did not do that. He said, you know, here my son who was lost is found, who was dead is alive. And he said, you know, bring the best robe, put a ring on his finger. Let's get the fatted calf. Let's celebrate. So that's the mercy and the grace of God. The mercy of God withholds the judgment that we deserve. Grace lavishes on us what we do not deserve. The mercy of God forgives our wanderings. And it's the grace of God that bestows on us the royal robe, the ring, and the celebration of heaven. Meaning, mercy pardons, grace gives more than that. It gives us what we do not even deserve. Grace transforms our lives forever. Grace changes us forever. So this is the grace of God. And the New Testament tells us that He is the God of all grace. There is the exceeding riches of His grace. There is the unlimited measure of His grace that transforms our lives and changes our lives forever. God, in His grace, releases to us whatever we need to change our lives. God imparts that grace to make us accepted in His eyes. God imparts that grace to do in us what we could never do for ourselves. God gives us grace to work through us things that we could never work ourselves. And God gives us His grace to change our very character, our very nature, and to make us who He wants us to be. So the grace of God makes us whole, uh, and, and it makes us whole on the inside. It, it, it brings healing into our lives. So here's the thing. While God is just such an amazing God of grace, and His grace is available to all of us in unlimited measure, there's one thing God requires of us. He wants us to come and receive that grace. We must come and receive that grace. Otherwise, the grace of God will be left um, uh, uh, unused, if you will. It will go in vain. It will be left unused as far as we are concerned, as far as, as an individual. That grace will not matter in my life, even though there is unlimited grace available. So whatever it takes, whether it's the grace for me to experience salvation, whether it's the grace for me to experience a change in my life, whether it's God's grace to see uh, to to see his work released through my life, whatever area area I need is grace, I must come to him to receive. For example, in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16, the writer of Hebrews says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. So here is God. He's seated on a throne, but he says that's the throne of grace. I mean, it's a place of grace. It is where this unlimited grace of God is flowing out. But let us come boldly to that throne. Let us come boldly that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. So if there is this God of unlimited grace, but I need to come to Him to receive that grace uh, that I need in my time of need. So what I just want to impress on each of our hearts is this. 
that there is unlimited grace available. Some of us may be in a stage in life, maybe we are believers and we love Jesus, and, uh, uh, but we are stuck somewhere. Maybe there are habits that you're struggling to give up. Maybe there are, there are circumstances that, that, that you say, you know, how can I overcome these circumstances? Or there are things that you want to do, but you feel helpless doing it. Whatever, we may be in different situations and different circumstances in life. But one thing that we all have access to is this throne of grace, that we can come boldly to receive mercy and grace. Mercy forgives, grace clothes us with royalty. We can obtain mercy and grace. They flow together to help us in our time of need. So no matter what wrong we've done, there is mercy and there is grace. We can pray together today on the program to, uh, for us to walk before, walk to the throne of grace and receive mercy and grace. I have a calling to be salt and light. I'm part of a family that empowers me to fulfill this commission. I have a job, but then I was always passionate to study the Word. We are students from different walks of life. My potential is best tapped in an environment like this. Where I get the opportunity to reach out and to minister. A culture where there's supernatural impartation through anointed leaders. I can now aim for excellence because that is God's beautiful design. I am equipped to impact. Come. Discover. Fulfill. Admissions are now open for the academic year starting July 2016. You can download the application form from our website apcwo.org slash Bible College. For inquiries about the course and other details, please do get in touch with us on our toll-free number 1-800-300-00998 within India or on plus 91-748-321-3597 if you're calling from outside India. You can also email us at contact at apcwo.org. Before we close the program today, let's just join our hearts together. There may be some of us watching who may have never received Jesus into our lives and you happen to be watching this program and you've heard of how God changed the life of this man called Paul who became the great apostle. You've heard of how God changed the life of this man, John Newton, and who wrote one hymn that has, that has been sung through the centuries and is still being sung today because God changed his life in such a powerful way. God is still the God of all grace. And no matter who you are, no matter where you are in life, if you and I will come to this throne of grace, He is there to extend mercy and grace to change our lives forever. As I pray, I want you to pray with me and believe and ask the Lord for His mercy and grace to impact your life today and change, bring about change like He has done in the lives of many thousands of others. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Father, for your mercy and grace to be extended, God, to each one watching this program. You are the God of all grace. You are the God of unlimited grace. You are the God who is exceeding abundant, unlimited in your grace. And I pray that will be released, O oh God, your mercy and grace to each person. Let sins be forgiven. Let hearts be changed. Let lives be changed. Let new life begin. Father, I pray this in Jesus' name. And I thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. And until next time, remember, live life the Jesus way. Just one word.
At your voice the blind began to see And the lame can walk, the captives are set free A hardened heart can finally start to feel Will you speak that same voice to me? Lord, you made beauty, you make me new when you speak to me. I hear a voice in whispers my name. And all at once it quiet my pain. If your voice let the sun and I was so become, you can speak in light of my world. But just my Oh